I'm delighted to introduce the first speaker of our second panel today, Lawrence A. Rickles. After 30 years at the University of California in Santa Barbara, Lawrence Rickles is currently Professor of Art and Theory at the University in Karlsruhe, and the European Graduate School appointed him the Sigmund Freud Professor. The NYU German department was excited to welcome him as a visiting professor in 2007 and 2008, and we are happy to have him back here in New York with us today. Among his wide array of publications, of which I can only give you a minuscule sample here, are Aberrations of Mourning, Writing on German Crypt, 1988, The Three Volume Study, Nazi Psychoanalysis, 2002, The Devil Notebook, 2008, Geprüfte Seelen, 2013, and his next book is Spectre, Rickles' Study of James Bond, which will appear with a new venue, anti Oedipus Press, in 2013. As these titles illustrate, Lawrence A. Rickles is an expert on commem commemoration and on the question of whether anything ever actually goes silent. His work as a theorist, critic, and trained psycho Therapist revolves around the intricacies and aberrations of mourning situated at the crossroads of psychoanalysis, technology, the Frankfurt School, deconstruction, and the arts. Professor Rickles' talk today is entitled The Rocket and the Ambivalent Introject. Please join me in welcoming Lawrence A. Rickles. Thank you, Danya, for the generous introduction. My presentation today is lifted out of a, a study in progress to be titled Germany, a Science Fiction. Uh, it's in three parts, the version today, but first a preamble. Robert Bramkamp's 2002 film, Test Stand 7, part documentary of the V2 rocket, part adaptation of Gravity's Rainbow, relied in both parts on the expertise of Friedrich Kittler, who appeared twice in person in the film. But what I learned only last year while reading Bramkamp's book to his film, watching the film doesn't give this away, was that the director's impetus or license for making the film came out of his reading of the case of California. For his book, Bramkamp conducted an extensive interview with Kittler, which goes off purpose when he raises the question of the techno body as object or objective of the sci-fi impulse. And I quote, I believe it is true that every cyborg or cyberspace film and all techno fantasy, techno philosophy, including Lawrence Rickles, <laughs> that they all refer to and affirm the conceptual hoped for and feared fusion of human bodies with non-organic materials. Today, today that would be silicon. I am, I believe, the only skeptic on this score for the simple reason that I believe that technology is far too good to knock around forever with us humans. When Bramkamp next brings up Pynchon's provenance of the rocket as one from the feminine dark, to bring it into association with the internal feminine of mourning, I entered into my compilation of group or adolescent psychology. Kittler elides the mourning and identifies Pynchon's feminine dark simply as Mother Earth, the rocket's point of departure. It was technology that thus left the Earth behind at takeoff, Kittler underscores. And he adds that it is incidental to the significance of this rupture whether a rocket is manned or not. Rickles draws a very strict parallel between psychoanalysis as he thinks, the most formative science or theorization of the 20th century on the one hand and technology on the other hand. I'm not so sure and would argue instead that Freud was simply mistaken in his analysis of the essence of technology and civilization and its discontents where all machines are always only prostheses of humans. They are only reading glasses, better eyes, better ears, and so on. As I said before, that is a very, very narcissistic view of technology. It could be described in far more inhuman terms, such as the way a coral branch grows. Technology is more likely to accept such anorganic principles than orient itself to lung and muscles. That is precisely the trick of technology, that it can't and really doesn't want to do that. Before the disagreement became a ventriloquist's dispute, 
back in the 1980s during Hitler's two quarters as guest professor at UC Santa Barbara. I offered what I thought was a good boundary. Granted, the technology is auto-accelerated beyond corporeal analogs or prostheses. Just the same, a Freudian consumerist perspective on media is back when it comes time to bury the dead and the mass media perform the service. In gramophone film typewriter, Hitler had in fact made room, to my mind, for this proviso by identifying the site of every new generation of spooks as the latest new border or outer limit of media extension of the sensorium. But that one man's technology is another man's mass psychology apparently isn't a compromise, it's a trigger. One, I begin again with an exogenous choice. In her 1963 essay, The Conquest of Space and the Stature of Man, Hannah Arendt also held that man cannot reclaim by outer space transport the Archimedean point of his universal science. She also discounted as special effect of this vanishing point the trust in man's mutation within a large scale biological process of which technology would be a part. But she argued that it is far from incidental that the craft is occupied. For example, the astronaut shot into outer space and imprisoned in his instrument-ridden capsule where each actual physical encounter with his surroundings would spell immediate death might well be taken as a symbolic incarnation of Heisenberg's man, the man who will be less likely ever to meet anything but himself and man-made things the more ardently he wishes to eliminate all anthropocentric considerations from his encounter with the non-human world around him. This external view at close quarters is the import of what's already down to earth. Continue quoting. If we look down from this point upon what is going on on earth and upon the various activities of men, then these activities will indeed appear to ourselves as overt behavior. Under these circumstances, speech and everyday language would indeed be no more a meaningful utterance that transcends behavior, even if it only expresses it, and it would much better be replaced by the extreme and in itself meaningless formalism of mathematical science. In his 1988 essay, Media and Drugs and Pynchon's Second World War, Kittler summarized the amalgam that rises up before the rocket POV of gravity's rainbow. When technologies take the upper hand over science and aesthetics, information alone counts. And after all, semiotics and the behaviorist techniques Pynchon analyzes as strategies of war share certain roots. While information is the plain text of technology, it circulates among men shot through with explanation, as Walter Benjamin advised in The Storyteller. In other words, as opinion, the basis for the behavioral administration of mass psychology. What Arendt looks down on, both explicitly and by absence or implication, are the two tendencies in the organization and comprehension of mass media society, the behavioral and the psychoanalytic, which in science fiction reign as two orders of simulation. In Aldous Huxley's <clears throat> Brave New World, these orders, which can also be characterized as the public relations trajectory of adaptation to information or opinion, and the advertising aspect of identification keep company in one belief system. The future divinity of behavioral and biological adaptation is addressed as our Freud, although he prefers to be called uh, our Ford, although he prefers to be called our Freud when psychological issues are raised. Otherwise, the trend assigned by Huxley to Fordism in 1932 hosts tendencies which have been kept distinct from Freud's name. While it is possible to derive one more paranoid proverb out of Pynchon's reduction of psychoanalysis to occult hobbyism and gravity's rainbow, we might also recognize in the foregrounding of the amalgam of Pavlovian behaviorism, film, and rocket, another story or allegory of a joint delegation, for example, the belief system Ford Freud. To make the line of separation legible also as adhesive strip, we turn to science fiction, the genre in which Pynchon initially tested his decision to write. 
Philip K. Dick's 1964 novel, The Simulacra, follows out a Freudian understanding of mass mediatized psychology, but is literally made in Germany and continued in California. In the future, a German Californian state, USEA, projects its mass psychology around the mascot status of a ruling couple consisting of the German chancellor, who is in reality an android, and the first lady, in fact, a role played by an actress. It is a corporation in corporation organized around at least one real identity or missing person with countless co-signatories who are figments of the imagination engaged in keeping a couple of identifications in safe deposit. Untranslated German words in Dick's text attest to this process of encryptment. The geheimness of a couple of faux persons is carried by the ruling class of so-called Geheimnisträger in order to uphold a state of preservation. But although the USEA state of incorporation fails in the course of the novel, all those trying but inevitably failing to effect a political correction of history through time traveling intervention have been in reality training for the ability to mourn. While time travel in Dick's novel, invented at the time of the merger of California and Germany, remains a magnet for fantasies of cure-all reversals of history, the technology itself doesn't deliver change, and its alternate histories promote instead acceptance of the irretrievability of loss. Daniel Galui's 1964 SF novel, Simulacrum III, follows out the tendency to simulation in public relations. The founder of public relations, Freud's nephew, Edward Bernays, recalls in his 1928 study, Propaganda, the example of pianos for sale. Rather than extol the attractiveness of pianos, for example, which would be mere advertising, the PR strategy was to publicize via miscellaneous reports, interviews, and editorials the hottest new accessory of the home, the music room or corner. Once the need for such a space or displacement was instilled, it followed that pianos would meet the need to complete the installation as recognizable. The gist of the anecdote is that the PR campaign organizes blanks that advertising and consumerism can proceed to fill. Because the public is ready-made while its adaptation to opinion is ongoing, the PR campaign must be in a position to project or forecast consumerism via sampling of opinions and taking of polls and surveys. In Simulacrum 3, because the business of polls and surveys has impinged on everyday life, an electronic simulation of consumer society offers the welcome alternative. The changes that pollsters can only ask about can be directly introduced into the simulacrum and the reactions of the simulated figures observed in double real time. The world <clears throat> to which we are introduced through the protagonist Hall, who is one of the programmers of Simulacrum 3, turns out, however, to be yet another simulation. And yet this simulated world reacted to stimuli by preparing to launch the very simulacrum project that subsumes its own reality. At one point, Hall is dismayed over the grief of Jinx, his deceased employer's daughter, which he characterizes as a striking throwback to the mid-20th century, before enlightenment had swept away the vicious cruelty of the funeral convention. In those days, proof of death had to be established on a practical plane. Those who attended wakes and funeral services saw and believed, and they went away convinced that the loved one was actually beyond this life and that there would be no complications arising from a supposedly dead person showing up again. That the close ones also went away nursing traumatic wounds made little difference. In the future, according to Simulacrum 3, the news of a loved one's passing means that the body has already been removed. The SF forecast is a 1936 diagnosis in Benjamin's The Storyteller. The removal of the dying and the dead from all living quarters circumscribes the encapsulation and internalization of an inoculation we began taking in with the novel. 
the protagonist's death, death scene at the end of the novel as reclamation of the whole life as meaningful, rendering that life at every moment the life of one who died thus and then was what the readership swallowed, an inoculation service that accelerated, according to Benjamin, with the advent of information. What proves jolting in Simulacrum Three is to witness the sudden disappearance of your neighbor, simply gone without a trace. This new shock of zero or beyond, which is specific to the electronically simulated nature of its setting, and which Fussbinder's 1973 TV adaptation, World on a Wire, carries forward as its theme, um, introduces the onset of mourning according to the logic of a PR campaign. I quote, watching a man disappear isn't something you simply shrug off and forget. PR campaigns must get around the consumer's ability to shrug off even the advertisements of new products. The evidence of electronic erasure simulates a change that remembrance supplies and supports. Utter disappearance of the one you're with in the same instant like a blip from the screen promotes the inside view of reality as infinite regress of simulacra, but each inner world is now a place for absence. World War I was the setting for the departure of one model of mass media society from the other one, while Bernays won the war for public relations, which found successful application in the propaganda of the Entente. His uncle Freud won the post-war period for psychoanalysis over the symptomatizing bodies of war neurotic soldiers. Freud's inside view of the shell-shocked soldier as incapacitated by a conflict in his ego between the peace ego and its parasitic doppelganger, the war ego, issued the owner's manual to the psyche's protection and projection. Psychoanalysis was sent to the front of emergency treatment of the war neurotic soldiers during World War I, but became in this wartime setting of treatment, and then in time for the second coming of the war, under the more aggrandized aegis of psychological warfare, what I prefer to call greater psychoanalysis, the eclecticized and reunified amalgam of all the therapies that took their departure from Freud's science or otherwise shared a border including behaviorism. The consensus in Gravity's Rainbow is that nothing will remain of the psychoanalytic specialization in the psi section, namely the search for some measurable basis for the common experience of being haunted by the dead. And yet the search for some measurable basis of this experience aligns the project with Pavlov's own move into the study of psychopathology. The immediate context for this move was a mishap that befell the dogs. Traumatization came into focus as factor in conditioning or deconditioning following a flood that nearly wiped out the entire test population. The surviving dogs were manifestly changed by the ordeal. All their conditioned reflexes were gone. They simply wouldn't eat regardless of stimuli. And the excessive fear they showed no longer fit the grid of response. In the course of reconditioning the animals <clears throat> at considerable effort, Pavlov saw the connection between their aberrancy and traumatized human behavior. The give and take of the stimulus response model of adaptation didn't bring about profound change. However, once the breakdown of psychic reality was factored in, a working model was secured for opening up the depth of the field of adaptation for far-reaching alteration. That Pavlov's breaking insight seems delayed or denied in the setting of research dedicated to obtaining through animals a so-called mechanistic explanation of human behavior is the form of tribute paid to the unspoken connection between the hub of human psychic aberration and the wheel of animal fatality or behavior. Pavlov's mother withdrew into psychosomatic illness, never to return when he was too young to hate her, but old enough to blame the environment rather than internalize the deprivation as his fault line. The influence of this absence, which the test dogs put into Pavlov's scientific perspective, is picked up in Gravity's Rainbow as the prospect of deconditioning or extinguishing a reflex to zero or beyond. Two. Pynchon's cultivation of the rocket 
follows out flight trajectories looping the American Cold War through the German World War II as the mass psychological tendency to carry loss forward unto the prospect of its reversal. While for the Pax Americana, as Hitler underscored, the rocket and the atom bomb could be combined in nuclear missiles, this functional merger of the effects of Europe's phantom wars could go through only by their uncanny proofing displacement into a continuous history of innovation. But in real or trauma time, the rocket took off as byproduct of the air war, which the Germans had already lost. From the phantasmagoria of the Axis to the extensive psychotechnical research and training already in the 1920s that made the German pilot over as autopilot ever in the ready position to merge with the machine in flight, the investment in air power as the ultimate total war front was all along, without knowing it, building up to the crypto fetish of rocket flight. Following the loss of World War I and flying into the loss of the second one, the crypto fetish carried forward the end as final victory. The premier lost cause was that of Troy, of course, and the miracle weapon of its overturning, the wooden horse. The reversal of Troy's lost cause, skewered upon one weapon ruse or fetish, was basic to the poetic historiography of Rome. Shakespeare, our first man on the scene of modernity's spectral transmissions, called the new weapon out in the harbor of world domination, Burnham Wood, the immobility of which was the guarantee the witches gave Macbeth that he would remain inviolate, save for the impossible prospect of the woods advancing. When Freud counted the, Macb the Macbeths among those wrecked by success, he gave the inside view of their other success as among, as among the most identified with losers in literature. That Lady Macbeth can't out the damn spot confirms an internal reservation about the success of her power couple, a success upon which she is wrecked. Since it is clear, klar, that Macbeth must realize that he cannot live forever, Freud considers Macduff's outcry that Macbeth has no, no children, the key to Macbeth's transformation. Macduff's outcry means, as Freud allows, that only a man without children could order children to be killed. But Freud overhears the curse of infertility upon success and succession. There would be more to hear along this line. Macbeth asks for male offspring in recognition of his wife's inspiring pledge of her own ruthlessness. In passing, she makes reference to her having had a child. It's the reason she knows of what she speaks. She declares that if she had vowed to kill her own infant as Macbeth vowed to kill Duncan, she would and could commit even that murder. When Freud speculates that poetic justice pays back the Macbeths for their crimes against generation, by granting them childlessness, he overlooks the contradiction he himself mentioned in passing, namely that the infertility fulfills Lady Macbeth's express wish that she be unwomaned to steal her and her husband's resolve to proceed to the first act of murder. That murder was to be the be all and the end all of consequence, the success that trammeled up succession, allowing the Macbeths to jump the life to come. In the season of Lady Macbeth's resolve, there is one spot of hesitation. She is unable to murder the man who in his sleep resembles her father, her dead father. That the patricide succeed, she vows to her husband that she would succeed in killing her dead child. Truth is, she would rather be a murdering mother than a motherer of substitutes, but can be neither. As in Hamlet, murder is tied to the second death of the dead. Getting rid of Duncan amounted for Lady Macbeth to losing the loss of her child and giving a wide berth to the afterlife of successful mourning. The Macbeths are not psychopaths. Instead, they scoop out the spousal medium of mourning, scrub it down, and detonate it. Against their nature, they fill up with the black magic of ruthlessness and destroy forever the very prospect of successful mourning, of succession through substitution. Heroism lies here, 
in wait for identification that is untenable, undeclared, but ever so strong. Ever since Abraham Lincoln identified Macbeth as his favorite play, even quoting only days before his assassination, Macbeth's despairing envy of dead Duncan's respite from fitful betrayal, Macbeth has been the main prop of ambivalence toward the power invested in presidents. After Goethe's Wilhelm Meister's apprenticeship, any future German language author had to be initiated into the theater of his talent by his mother's gift. After Lincoln made his choice, future US presidents have had to memorize lines from Macbeth in adolescence. Gertrude Stein announced that the US was the most ancient culture of the 20th century because of the advanced preview of techno-mass modernity it absorbed through the Civil War. But the Civil War also invested the United States as techno-modern by its deposit of the lost war to be carried forward. There is an idealized aspect to this lost cause that's basic to Hollywood films in which the Southern POV holds a majority share in the monumentalization of US history. Off screen in the 1960s, a new culture industry of the event, reenactment, specialized in staging battle scenes from the Civil War. The parallel SF development of alternate history, which allowed reversal of losses but only, to, only by losing what history shows in the crowd of altered senses of an ending, was soon applied to the Civil War. Ward Moore's 1953, Bring the Jubilee, generally considered the first alternate history science fiction novel, projects a near future and par parallel present in which the South prevailed in the war between the states. For the 20th century, this victory meant inside the novel's alternate world that the Confederate States and the German Union were the two world powers. With the sudden available availability of time travel, the protagonist, <clears throat> who has studied and written on the war's history, interrupts interpretation to be there during the war, but then, back in the past, inadvertently sets the record back on course. But the new recording doesn't simply erase that the reversal of the lost cause is ongoing in its parallel world is the geheimness the protagonist carries. When in the late 19th century, Julian Green's parents had to choose the site for the European headquarters of his father's export-import firm and their new home, they selected Paris over Berlin because they felt the French, owing to the recent loss of the war with Prussia, would know what it meant to carry a lost war. While Mr. and Mrs. Green chose not to bind their lost war to the future of loss in German history, Julian Green would later reflect the pull of the German contest. His 1947 Sigete Vu was a Faust novel in which his intended quarrel was with Nietzsche on religious grounds. It was picked up by Melanie Klein in On Identification as her main prop for staging what she called projective identification, the secular corollary or corrective to becoming who you are. In Green's fabulation, the devil's gift of techno prowess and rejuvenation proceeds as body switching, which for Klein's theory illustrates the way in which we project parts of ourselves inside others to circumvent through a kind of outsourcing of functions of contact and defense, the anxiety producing rapport with the other. It is ultimately Klein's theorization of en la lettre of the complete sense around of crypt deposit and transmission. Green's corpus switching between the Faustian striving to lose like a winner, the modern German destiny of dissociation, and the allied determination to win as loser the redemptive ending of Green's Faust novel, was brought through Klein's reading into proximity to what I prefer to address as the ambivalent introject, which on Klein's turf and terms can be situated between projective identification and integration. Ambivalent introjection is basic to the setting of Pynchon's fabulation of the rocket as reconfigured beyond the former opposition as holds for true underworlds. The mix or mess of perpetrators and victims would be then the side effect of following upon, uh, following upon the onset of integration. Integration, a term and notion that Klein introduced into the lexicon of psychoanalytic theory in her 1940 essay on mourning. 
is not to be confused with or limited to the positive inclusion of elements of opposition and their adaptation to a greater whole. Integration in Klein's conception pulls up short before the prospect of irretrievable loss and includes the shortfall or incompletion in its structure. Just as the related effort of reparation cannot neutralize or deny the scene of destruction, so integration cannot circumvent or cleanse the untenable comparisons that find juxtaposition in the wake and shakeup of trauma. Out of the resulting chaos and turbulence, the impasse of traumatic history shifts toward the onset of the ability to mourn. Among the risks Pynchon takes in entering upon the ambivalent interject is that the story of rocket engineer Perkler begins to read like Gone with the Wind, set onto modern German history. Three. F.W. Murnau's rendering of the creature of the night as Doppelgänger made the jump cut basic to Friedrich Kittler's genealogy from German romanticism to film and psychoanalysis. It is by the German tradition's focus on the double to the exclusion of every other figuration of the occult that the first cinematic science fiction was German. No sooner projected, it was enlisted in the Nazi era, era of realization of science fantasy, which is why it was the prehistory to be forgotten of a genre identified as Cold War exclusive. In the documentary portion of Bramkamp's Test Stand 7, we learn that Fritz Lang's Woman in the Moon was shown in Nazi Germany only in an expurgated version that deleted the camera pans of the rocket designs because it was felt they already occupied and revealed the planning stage of the V1 and V2 rockets. The rockets that then took off bore as mascot insignia reference to Lang's film, on which, as teenager Werner von Braun had also worked as assistant to Germany's leading theorist of space travel, Hermann Obert, the film's technical advisor. Future worlds made in Germany were left unattended during the Cold War reception of science fiction. Then, beginning in the 1980s, the metropolis look was in our faces in films, music videos, and the redesign of Disneyland's Tomorrowland. What also remained largely unaddressed in post-World War II science fiction, as indeed, uh, as indeed in the public sphere at large until some turning point, again in the 1980s, was the Holocaust. When in his 2003 preface to 1984, Pynchon commented on its bracketing out of the Holocaust as George Orwell's requirement for thinking his way through in 1948 to the post-war period, he was also identifying his 1973 novel as on schedule with this staggering. I quote Pynchon, there is some felt reticence as if with so many other deep issues to worry about, Orwell would have preferred that the world not be presented the added inconvenience of having to think much about the Holocaust. The novel may even have been his way of redefining a world in which the Holocaust did not happen. That Nazi Germany was the first realized science fiction guaranteed that the long haul of Wiederholung and its compulsions would stagger indefinitely for both the recovering psychopaths and their heirs, the onset of the capacity for mourning. Bramkamp reassembles the film history of the rocket by pulling the realized rocket back through gravity's rainbow. What the streamlining of science faction deferred not only for German history, undergoes ambivalent interjection in the course of Pynchon's rocket novel. Gravity's Rainbow hitched its status as new Moby Dick to the pursuit of the, of the V2 rocket and its continuity shots, which at or as the end of the rainbow, almost as 9-11 forecast, detonated the movie theater in Los An Angeles in which Pynchon assembled his readership. But before the Nazi rocket enters American history through this loop with cinema, it is reassembled on the track of its future development as V to the nth power and the meeting of otherwise opposed or repressed contingencies. In Southwest Africa, Germany routed the Herero Rebellion and sent the vanquished nation into the desert to perish. In Pynchon's fiction, the surviving Hereros, the empty ones, follow out their trauma-enforced suicide drive in voluntary service to the rocket. 
Pynchon's Schwarzkommando, the mystical blue flower in the no man's land of technologization and death, which guards and guides the superversion of the V2 all the way to its strike against LA, has its recognition value in the racism of the GIs who may have conquered Germany but are wary of blacks equipped with rockets. The unlikely fiction of the Nazi African German Brigade meets the fact of unlikelihood on the other side. For the World War II effort, no African American was admitted into the US Air Force. It is by the effects of racism that Pynchon conjoins the inscrutable mass murder in the foreground of the Nazi war with the crypto fetishism of the rocket, which must be read as trying to outfly it. The war of political differences or even that of competition between special interests was a diversion. Quote, secretly, it was being dictated instead by the needs of technology, the real crises were crises of allocation and priority, not among firms, it was only staged to look that way, but among the different technologies, plastics, electronics, aircraft, and their needs. Somewhere over the positivism of machine histories for which the Holocaust does not compute, there is the techno-war revalorized as continuing beyond both the mass death and the opposition. A score of pages following the disclosure that the air war modified precisely, deliberately by bombing sites for conversion, only waiting for the right connections to be set up to be switched on, an exchange is opened at a new rate. Is there room here for the dead? The guilty assumption of a proper response has to be corrected twice over for the shame of it. Those now getting through the recent past and making it to the post-war period at the end of the sentencing recognize the worst parts, the shame. I meant, would I be allowed to bring my dead in with me? They are my credentials, after all. This is not, however, a summons to uh, the ancestral dead. I mean the ones who owe their deadness directly to me. The closing reference to a shame that cannot be left behind, that hangs on as corporeal connection with dead bodies, connects building everything to the advertised and internalized prospect of making good again objects of repair. Bianca, the woman given in passing in Pynchon's fiction as daughter, love object, and object of mourning, searches in Blumkamp's film for her origin in the rocket. That she keeps running up against the so-called oven inside it sparks the eternal flame in a place gone without mention. But the eternal or internal feminine of mourning cannot draw us onward by so direct a hit. And so the film enters the blind alley of the figure of the severed and thrown hand to mediate our identification with Bianca's search for the history internal to the rocket. The severed and thrown hand touches on the significance of Antwerp, even in name, as one of the main targets of the V2 rocket attacks. But it also joins in the mystery of a photograph of Werner von Braun's arm in a cast taken at the moment he was crossing the threshold to his post-war assimilation. The mystery Kubrick perhaps revalorized as the reflex salute otherwise so hard to contain in his 1963 Dr. Strangelove. From Ernst Kapp through Freud and McLuhan, the detachable hand waves through the prosthetic understanding of our relationship to technologization. In Pynchon's novel, The Rocket, as in Kittler's genealogy of media, opens up a technological horizon of auto-development before which the prosthetic reach of our following falls short. And yet, to the extent that technologization cannot be separated from the European culture, culture of death diagnosed in Pynchon's novel, the prosthetic relation comes to be reinserted in the wake of violence that we cannot but consider as externalized in our technological relation. By the alternation between direct hits with the recent past and blind alleys of allegorization, Test Stand 7 doubles back to stagger and layer morning's release within the ongoing work of integration that alone will make history contemporary. Thus, Bramkamp would bring us closer to what he identifies as his ongoing goal, collective narration, 
which extends to mourning. Otherwise, mourning is the prerogative of individuals or couples and group commemoration solely a form of denial. We will catch up with deferred individual mourning only if the possibility of collective mourning can be reclaimed from the denial. The prospect is upon us. Thank you. Okay, we have time for two or three questions. How are you? <clears throat> My voice is getting back. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, there was so, so much going on, and and, um, and I appreciate the way you've excerpted from work that we are all anticipating to um, have us fold back against and uh, into our um, formed intention here, which is to com commemorate, which until right now was left. Uh, unreflected and uninterrogated, perhaps, because you see it as a um, kind of form of denial, if I understood correctly, the group commemoration, which pushes, and, and that makes a lot of sense. It may, it may be also um, a way to um, somehow arrest the individual meltdown of mourning. I'm wondering if if we can think about that further. Thank you very much for that. Um, I appreciated especially also your um, reading, well, so much. To lose like a winner and to win as a loser is something that needs further um, discussion, of course. But um, the way you um, put into dynamic um, reciprocity, integration in, in Melanie Klein and reparation as certain um, required movements of her thought and practice, but which you show uh, fall short, of course, of, of, and I suppose they need to, of any kind of uh, recuperative operation, right, or, or racing the edges of the destruction that had taken place, so that I wonder what kind of a miming, reparative behavior or grammars uh, indicate, as, as well as integration. Are they um, faking it till you make it, or, um, or part of something that will or will not stick, at, um, again, on the level of commem group commemoration or the, what you called some, at some point the forget together, um, which is to say a commemoration that actually um, purposefully annuls itself and the hard edges of, of loss that, with which you began, which is what happens when, when dis, disappearance occurs radically, I guess without residue. Um, and finally, um, these are just comments. You don't have to respond if you're not moved to do so, but I will be hurt if you do. Um, <laughs> that, I, of course, your oeuvre is immense and dense, so you probably have addressed this somewhere, but I'm not recalling immediately, and I'm seeing that the new inclusion of a foreign body um, is to be marked, and I may be mistaken, that of shame. I see that as a um, newbie, rookie, para concept, perhaps, and um, I want to welcome it. I've included shame before um, along um, its etymological um, history, because um, sham, hemt, and leichnam are all related. So been interested in the corporeal um, connection that shame harbors before. Benjamin writes about it too. 
but this was a quote from Gravity's Rainbow this time. Okay, so what I want to say is um, I've often been confused with ideologues who say you either have to mourn or you don't, or, you, or you're fucked. <laughs> um, I've always been confused with ideologues who um, talk about things like the inability to mourn or the refusal to mourn or these various failures uh, that one faces in mourning, um, which again suggests that mourning has to proceed, um, has to take one particular course. So for this larger project where I'm trying to um, theorize or make legible something that that's already happening. I mean, we have been living with Germany for a very long time, post-war Germany. Um, and I'm curious how that integration proceeds, has proceeded and continues to proceed, how we um, are making amends um, ultimately with the heirs to psychopathic violence. And this could now um, embrace other strata of history, other wars in the meantime, that so many of us <clears throat> um, are heirs to psychopathic violence. Um, so, uh, as you know, um, psychopathy, psychopathy would, has often been treated as a synonym of, um, you know, ruthlessness and inability to identify, and thus immediately um, that so-called inability to mourn. But what I've um, not invented, but tracked in the work of various um, analysts working during this period is, the, and, and in Winnicott quite spectacularly as well, is this um, sense that was derived from making psychopathy rather than psychosis, the old border concept, by making psychopathy into the new border concept that um, psych psychoanalytic theory um, could then address, um, that there seemed to be the possibility of um, bracketing out the violence from, because um, for Winnicott there's a great deal that's near normal and strong, egoically speaking, strong in a psychopath, that all that strength could be um, uh, separated out from the violence and directed as industry toward reparation. And so um, I see that, uh, which is at the individual level, as a model for reading, for example, the economic recovery of Germany, which coincided with the payments of, uh, of reparation to the victims. Um, that before the psychopath, or even the heirs to psychopathy, can um, even get to the beginning of the uh, ability to mourn, there has to be reparation and integration. So a larger structure, a larger process has to be underway if we really can begin to talk about mourning. When you discovered Kittler, what was it in him that you recognized as valuable to you and what, what absence did he address in terms of your thinking? Well, first off, you know, I knew him um, in the 80s quite well. We um, visited our campus for two quarters, and I had met him in Germany before. And um, my um, purpose early on was to uh, read uh, mass media, culture, society, or what have you, um, read it as occupying the missing place of our death cult. So I used Friedrich's work. I mean, he was the most brilliant, he had the most inflected um, reading of technology and its genealogies, certainly um, at that time. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that was my, as I said earlier on in the prologue, I was more interested in mass psychology, he more interested in technology. That became a split, I guess. First of all, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. A, con a continuation to Avital's and to your response and to the re-emergence of, of, of German's economy and the recuperative analysis and the introject and the denial mechanism that you've so wonderfully situated there, which was 
And this might even be uh, a recuperative move toward Hitler's technological state, but this exact inverted mechanism, or not an inverted mechanism, was perpetuated upon the victims who also accepted the, the money for recuperation that was helped in order to create um, a different recuperative psychology and mass, mass psychology in, in, in the state of Israel. And this is the other side of this disavowal and, and Winnicottian transitionals, um, which is very, very interesting because this is the technology of reenacting re an atrocity and also thinking that there can be some recuperation that would be fiscal yet understanding that this fiscal cannot cannot it all be recuperative aside for this disavowal which is which is fantastic if i would just i would just gloss that i don't have an answer but i would say that um, what replaces recuperation is integration it's a question of how to integrate. Um, all the um, survivors of the catastrophe. But not, not in the same way. <laughs> and um, just in a symbolic way, say, but that can also be powerful. <laughs> One could argue that um, West Germany and Israel were the two quintessential post-war states that had to uh, continue really in tandem. Mm. Okay, so this 